Hey, New Orleans, where y'all at? Woo! How we doing? <laughs> All right. It sounds like, for our guests, it sounds like y'all are having a lot of fun. The first question, as always, is, have you had a beignet yet? And are you going to get one before you leave? The answer to that has to be yes, so we can't start the thing. Anyway, it's great to have all of you here. Um, we have Jake Tapper and Maureen Dowd, two of the great thinkers uh, in our country. Um, you have seen them or you have read their work. Uh, in many instances, though, sometimes uh, you think these folks are one-dimensional folks because when Jake's not trying to skin me on CNN, he's doing other stuff. Um, and he is a writer of great renown. He is also, in my opinion, a great artist. If you haven't seen his cartoon work, you should see that as well. Maureen Dowd, who I've been knowing since I've been a baby, uh, her, her brother Martin was my tennis coach at Catholic University of America, if you can believe that, <laughs> has been, I was a terrible tennis player, but he was a good coach. Um, Maureen has been really one of the most insightful columnist, editorialist uh, about the current state of politics, of government, uh, and culture in the United States of America, and we are thrilled uh, to have both of them here, Maureen, to talk to Jake about his latest and greatest book. So please help me give them a great New Orleans welcome. Yeah, and Mitch was my brother's favorite, so. <laughs> um, okay, so I don't know if you guys remember the Stefan character on Saturday Night Live he would review. Yeah, I love him. He would <laughs> review nightclubs, and he'd say, this club has it all. Well, this book has it all. Elvis, Evil Knievel, Son of Sam, Montana Dive Bars, Fleet Street Pirates, Studio 54, Cocaine, Cheryl Teagues, Woodward and Bernstein, The New York Blackout. Um, this is following up on Jake's bestseller, The Hellfire Club. It's the same family, different generation. And I love the beginning of this book so much, and I just thought I'd get Jake to read it to set the tone. You can go, I, okay. I underline that, but you can go a couple graphs longer okay. if you want to the name of the dive Let, let me just also, uh, I want to thank the New Orleans uh, Book Festival and um, President Landrew and... Uh, um, <laughs> The great Maureen Dowd, it is such an honor to have her doing this. I mean, really, honestly, crazy. Insane. I should be interviewing her. Um, next she, time. Next time. She knows what a fan I am. And let me just also just say one more thing. I've been down to New Orleans uh, lots of times for uh, journalistic uh, reasons. Uh, unfortunately, after the levees fa failed after Katrina, but then also... Um, when the, for the BP oil spill, which my little girl at the time thought that I was coming down to New Orleans to help Obama clean the beach. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's great to be back uh, under happier circumstances and see the city thriving and being so successful and doing what you guys do the best. So it's good to see. It's really good to see. Okay, I will read the beginning of this book. Chapter one, Ike, Butte, Montana, June 1977. The toughest tavern in Big Sky Country wasn't the legendary Jimtown Bar near Lame Deer with its acre of spent beer cans under which a corpse or two were likely buried. It wasn't Al's Tavern near the Billings Sugar Plant with its buckshot scarred front door and concrete floor stained with blood and brains. No, that honor belonged to the Dead Canary a dive outside Butte, where the shot glasses once used to throw whiskey down the coal-dusted throats of dying miners, were now clasped by Hell's Angels and truck stop hookers, poachers and drug dealers from the Flathead Indian Reservation, plus the gang of circus freaks, more formally known as the pit crew of legendary daredevil Evil Knievel. I was one of those freaks. So that's how it starts. <laughs> I love dive bars, so that's an opening that's going to lure me in immediately. <laughs> I love all of Jake's books, but I especially love this one because it's about a young woman who grew up in Washington, D.C., and whose father worked at the Capitol and loved the Navy bean soup in the cafeteria, <laughs> all like me. And this young woman was an intern at the Washington Star in 1977, which I was, and she's covering her first crime story 
about a woman who has been brutally killed and the killer has dumped her body. And that was my first big story at the Star. So many things rang a bell with me. You write fiction with real people and incidents sprinkled in, and it's really cool. He mentions Jim Bellows, who was my boss at the Star, and Willard Scott, who was a longtime weatherman in DC and also had a show called B Bozo the Clown. <laughs> I went on that show when I was little, and Willard famously would pull the ponytails of, of girls on the show. And I wore my hair in a ponytail, but he didn't pull it. And I felt like a total failure. <laughs> <laughs> so he was probably intimidated, honestly. He probably sensed, I'm not going to mess with this one. Uh, Jake, you call what you do here spelunking in the caves of history. Why do you like to mix real stuff into your fiction? So. Uh, uh, this is the, as Maureen said, this is the third um, book in the, in the trilogy, I guess, uh, about the Martyr family. Um, Charlie Martyr, who is uh, a member of the House and then Senate, his uh, brilliant zoologist wife, Margaret, and their kids, Lucy and Ike. Um, and the first book takes place in the 50s, the second book takes place in the 60s, and this, this last one's in 1977. I'm a history geek. I love history, and I love learning things that I didn't know. And the first book um, takes place during the McCarthy era, the second book during the Rat Pack era, and this is like during the weird era of um, between Nixon and Reagan, uh, the Carter era, the beginning of it. And there was just so much weird stuff that happened in 1977 in the US at that time that you wouldn't believe uh, that it all happened that one year unless you did the research, which I did. And that's also why I put endnotes in all my books so people can see what I made up and what I didn't make up. Um, because often it's the stuff I didn't make up that's the, the weirdest stuff. Uh, in 1977 alone, you have, in addition to Star Wars and Saturday Night Fever coming out, you have Evil Knievel literally jumping sharks um, and that's, by the way, like five months before Fonz tries it. Um, you have the New York City black, blackout, you have Studio 54 opening, you have the death of Elvis. I mean, just one after another after another. And the truth is stranger than fiction is a cliche, but it's actually true. There's a conversation that um, Lucy Martyr, who may or may not be partially uh, based on Maureen, uh, <laughs> there's a conversation she has with her dad about all of the members of Congress that are, have been embroiled in scandal in, in the previous years. And I made up one of, there's like 10 of them, and I made up one of them. Uh, and that's only because it was Ted Kennedy and it was an incident that take place like 10 years later. So I felt like I couldn't, it, it's just th where he's seen off, uh, like where is he, in like Monte Carlo with a girlfriend and in, the, in a yacht and Orrin Hatch says, I see you've changed your position on offshore drilling. And um, <laughs> yeah. That's a real story, but since it takes place 10 years later, I just gave it to a Senator Callahan. But, yeah, uh, he changed the Senator. But all the others are real. But all he the still made him Irish. <laughs> well, he, I had to be true to the, to the material, the source material. <laughs> he was Irish. Anyway, go ahead. Um, yeah, I read somewhere that you started off thinking the 70s were bland, which I did too, and then I was kind of shocked to find that for many younger people, that's kind of a legendary decade. Yeah, I, I exactly right. I was going to skip to the 80s, uh, and I was told by a, a few folks uh, who I'd lived through the 70s, but I was born in 69, so it wasn't like a, I wasn't having like you know, I wasn't living right. I mean, I was just kind of like going to grade school. But uh, I was told by some people that were in their 20s in that era that I shouldn't skip the 70s; that they were off the hook, and I, I, I couldn't believe it, and then I looked into it, and everybody thinks sex, drugs, and rock and roll was the 60s, but it wasn't, it was the 70s, and it was nuts. And Studio 54 alone uh, is deserving of, and has been you know, uh, featured in films and, and documentaries and books, but yeah, no, it's a wild time. I haven't even mentioned uh, Bigfoot, I haven't mentioned the UFO sighting, everybody in the 70s was seeing UFOs. Um, anyway, lots of weird stuff, cults, Cults were a big thing. Um, are you an Elvis fan? You start chapters with little bits of his lyrics. My sister is here, and she saw Elvis twice, once in that famous white jumpsuit in Vegas. I, w I am an Elvis fan. Uh, and Elvis was the first musician I liked. Uh, and I was eight when he died. 
and it was, I was sad. I was really sad. I loved, I thought he was cool. Uh, like I, I was an Elvis fan, like um, all my friends were much cooler than me and they had, uh, they were fans of Kiss, uh, the heavy metal rock group and, um, or whatever it was. And uh, I was, so, so people would come to my birthday party and they'd give me like an Elvis mirror or an Elvis portrait or an Elvis picture. And I still have all this stuff, my wife, to my wife's chagrin, uh, in, in storage. But yeah, no, I, I, I loved, Elvis, I thought he was like the first really cool music icon that I, I latched onto. You blend in a lot of real characters like Roy Cohn, but not Donald Trump, even though 77 was the start of his rise. Yeah, I did not bring in Donald Trump because I didn't think, I thought about it, but um, I mean, there's all of these books are written from the perspective, uh, it's taking place in 1954, taking place in 1962, taking place in 1977, but all of them have today infused in them because yesterday is so much a part of today. Roy Cohn is a character in the first book, uh, which takes place during the McCarthy era, and obviously uh, in, this, in this third book too, uh, he, I had to put him in Studio 54 because he was at Studio 54 and he was the attorney for the, the guys, uh, was Rubel and Schrager, who started 50, Studio 54. And, you know, you don't have to remind people, but, you know, uh, Joe McCarthy had Roy Cohn as a protege and Roy Cohn had Donald Trump as a protege. I mean, that's just, that's just factual and there is that connective tissue. I thought about putting Trump in, but I didn't think he would be famous enough for any of my characters to know he, who he was in 1977. Yeah. So, I, and I didn't need to because I had Roy Cohn in there. That's what um, Pat Moynihan called defining deviancy downwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alfred Hitchcock used to have a couple of images in his head and build around that to do a movie. He wanted to do a scene at Mount Rushmore and a scene at the United Nations, and that became North by Northwest. Do you start with a couple of images or ideas and build from there? That's a, such a good question. Yes, I do. So like in the second book, for example, I knew I wanted to have a scene take place at the Oscars, and I knew I wanted to have a, play, a scene take place at the Hollywood sign. And so, because the second book takes place in Hollywood. For this one, I knew that motorcycles, because Ike is, uh, Ike is the son uh, of the family, he, and he's kind of a lost soul. He was in the Marines, and he had a horrible uh, incident that took place in, in Lebanon, a fictitious one, and so he's, he, he, kind of, he goes AWOL and jo ends up on the motorcycle pit crew of Evil Knievel. So I knew motorcycles had to be a big part of the book, and just thinking about the climax of the book, which I wanted to combine with January 6th in a way, just the idea of an angry mob going after politicians um, and also motorcycles. And I just, I was thinking about all of that. And so I have it take place in this fictitious island, Pitchfork Island, uh, off the coast of Georgia, which is not a real place. And, because um, people ask me, uh, and I'm like, it, no, it's, I made it up. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I did start off with that idea of like, I need Ike, I hope this isn't a spoiler alert, but I need Ike at least attempting to save the day with a motorcycle involved somehow. Um, I would love to write fiction, but sometimes I think as journalists, we train ourselves to avoid fantasizing about stories because you have to be so rigorous about not embellishing the facts. So just a little backstory on this. I've been trying to get Maureen to write a novel for a long, <laughs> long time and constantly encouraging her because I'm sure it would be amazing. Yeah, and I'm going to start with a handsome CNN anchor. <laughs> who gets murdered. I did know... J <laughs> on stage. Who gets murdered in the first chapter. I did know Jake in his bachelor days, and he's always been very dashing. <laughs> See, oh. this is times like that, I wish my wife was here to hear it. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I, it, is, it, it is a challenge to go from journalism to novel writing, and it did take some um, uh, moments of trying to get comfortable with the idea. So for the first book, between draft one and draft two, 
I, I had an epiphany where I was just like, look, I'm writing a novel. I'm just going to have Joe McCarthy and Roy Cohn say things. I just came up with a set of rules, which was I'm not going to have them say or do anything that seems out of character. I'm not going to have, you know, Joe McCarthy stab somebody. But if I'm going to write a novel, I'm going to write a novel. And, and I really have to just, like, service the reader. And so I just need to get comfortable with that. And so it became... Um, I became more comfortable with it, but I, I know exactly what you're talking about, the discomfort of, well, how can I have Evil Knievel saying or doing things that he didn't do? Um, and the idea is because it's a novel and I just have to do it and, and the hope that the reader enjoys it and know that anybody who says I'm accusing the Evil Knievel of doing X, Y, Z doesn't understand why this book is in the fiction section. I also know the secret of why Jake is so lithe, because what did you lose, 30 pounds last year or the year before? I lost, and, yeah. And I wrote him to say, what's the secret? Eat, eating less and exercising more. It was no, a bit. It was, <laughs> no, it was Nutribullet. Nutribullet? No, 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 no. Uh, the, no you're it thinking. was a blender with smoothies. For oh, I had a, I, I, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I started doing a lot of smoothies. That was... Uh, instead of, because it fills you, and it's like mostly ice. Yeah. <laughs> so when do you get time to write? Because um, by the time I finish reading five papers and you know magazines and everything at night, I'm just kind of spent. So I, um, I'm a, first of all, I'm a little nuts. So that, that just, uh, I just acknowledge that, my, that I'm like a, um, 45 record played at 33, uh, and I, I, I understand, like I just pack more into a day, and I just, because I'm very antsy and constantly always working. So like I have with me uh, a computer and an iPad, and I'm working on a graphic novel on the iPad and a nonfiction book on the computer, and I just, so I'm at the airport and I'll just sit down and I'll work on it. So that's one. And two is I just steal time any time, any, any chance I get. So on an airplane, uh, in, a, in a green room, I'm always just working, and I find myself very fulfilled by working, if it's a topic that I'm interested in. Um, so this is your first book where you tried to write in the first person, yeah. or you wrote in the first person. And you said you had a, a, a woman editor who helped you with um, Lucy's voice, yeah. the, our heroine. And uh, how, how did she help? Um, so I, I had two editors that were incredibly helpful. One of them was just um, not as important an editor uh, as, as, as the Christina, the, the woman editor I had, but he was an expert on motorcycles. His name, was Mark Gar His name is Mark Gardner, and he is a, he's a writer and a motorcyclist. I've never ridden a motorcycle in my life, and the main character, Ike, is a motorcycle expert, and the book takes place with Evil Knievel. So I had to write convincingly about riding and driving and knowing a lot about motorcycles. So I hired Mark to review the sections and make it sound as though I know the difference between a, a you know, a, a kickstand and, a, and, a, and an engine, and which I don't. Um, so that was helpful. Uh, it was more subtle to have Christina help me write in the voice of Lucy. The book goes back and forth chapters written in Ike's voice, chapters written in Lucy's voice. I wanted them to sound like two different people. Uh, it was not a stretch for me to figure out how to sound like a 20-year-old who'd lost his way, uh, who was a male and disillusioned with the world. That was not tough. Um, but uh, an ambitious, smart woman writer in DC, even though it wasn't as tough as I thought it was going to be because she's actually the character most like me out of all four of the members of the family. But I'm not a woman, and I don't necessarily understand constantly, you know, all the time how women think. Uh, and um, so I had Christina help me. And for instance, just like small things like a reference to cute boots which is something that Lucy references and is not a phrase I had ever uttered or thought <laughs> in my life. Um, but I wanted Lucy to be a convincing character, and Christina was really, really helpful. Her name's Christina Kovac. She's a writer uh, uh, unto her own right, and really, she was really helpful with me. 
but also just, just getting inside the character and having her love Lucy and um, we would just like talk about her and, and try to figure out you know, what was motivating her. Also like her, Lucy falling in love with this character in the book, um, Max, who, um, I'm sorry, not Max, Harry, uh, Max is a dad, Harry, and I've never fallen in love with a man before, and I wanted to convincingly write about that, and I could imagine some of it, but I wanted to make sure it sounded real, so. I always love reading love scenes by people I know, because oh boy. it's so weird, <laughs> but yours are hot. <laughs> Are they hard to write? Um, they're, they're, uh, they're uncomfortable to write sometimes, but, um, but uh, first of all, it's, it, I try to write uh, the love scenes with the less is more uh, uh, rule, knowing that whatever people are imagining in their heads when they're reading this is gonna be much better than any specificity I provide. So it's more like allusions to things that are happening. And um, yeah, it's not the thing I'm most comfortable writing about, but I mean, it is important to have sex scenes or at least allusions in a, in a book. There's a sex scene kind of in the first book between the husband and wife, and then there's a scene in the second book where uh, one of Sinatra's hangers on, takes her top off in a hot tub in front of Charlie, and then there's some stuff in this one, and I just have to think, okay, what's the scenario that I can put in front of the reader that will excite them, and I, I'm just writing as sparingly as possible, but maybe they will find it hot. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, Lucy, as uh, I've seen in journalism, has her scoop stolen by men, and you have a feminist creed de coeur like America, Ferraris, and Barbie. And uh, I just wanted you to read that. Okay. It's underlined. So. Um, no, down at the bottom. I know, I know, but I just want to give the premise. Oh. So the premise is that in 1977, the Justice Department is not going to prosecute Wayne Hayes, who was a congressman who was engaged in all sorts of chicanery. So, um, the, the, and the newspaper, the star uh, that Lucy worked at at the time, she goes to a different newspaper, and that's part of the plot, is one of the reasons that they're able to get her is because she's sick of this happening, of her scoops being given to men. Um, so editors can do anything, I said. They're omnipotent, like department chairs, Mom said, and appropriators, added Dad. Was it because you're an intern, Mom said, Mom asked, or because you're a woman? Yes, I said. And this isn't the first time it's happened. Usually they just fold my mini scoops into other larger stories, but this one was so big it was an act of outright theft, D.B. Cooper. I was trying to play it off as no biggie, but the truth is, it incensed me. My whole life, males, first teachers and boys, then professors and college men, now reporters and fossilized editors, had downplayed my intellect, my accomplishments, my worth. The clever Catch-22 men had constructed, women who protested being treated as inferiors were regarded as whiny or shrill, thus proving we were inferior or didn't belong and that the misogyny was justified, rational. Very good. <laughs> and um, speaking of feminists, your daughter Alice has already written a book. How old is she? She's 16. She's 16. She wrote, it was a children's book. She wrote a children's book uh, yeah. about the importance of girls raising their hand in school. She's adorable. She's something else, yeah. Yeah. And uh, it made me curious what you think about women's rights eroding in America. Um, it's pretty uh, unbelievable to watch, uh, and uh, look, I, I, my mom is a, is a strong woman, and I think I've been, I wouldn't say I've always been the most enlightened soul in the world, but, but I know it's cliche for people to say as the father of a daughter, but seeing, having a daughter, 
you see things that you can't unsee as a man or a woman, I suppose, but the women have probably already experienced it, which is the degree to which women or girls are just automatically devalued uh, compared to boys. And so watching all, thank you. <laughs> See, if we didn't live in this world, that would have been a rousing ovation. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm married to a feminist and my daughter is a very strong girl and my son and I are both feminists. And it's incredible to watch the degree to which um, still to this day, women are treated as inferior, and it's, it boggles my mind. It was fun to write Lucy for that reason, because not, I didn't have to, I, I knew that stuff. I'm sure that, that Christina helped, it, helped me with it, but like, it's not tough to see that happening. I mean, it's, you know, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And um, so I saw you w got the idea for Evil Knievel at your pal, Jimmy Kimmel's Idaho fishing cabin. I did. His and, bar uh, is decorated with all this evil Knievel stuff. And I will confess, um, even though I'm old enough to remember evil Knievel, uh, his charm eluded me uh, at, <laughs> at age uh, five when he attempted to jump Snake Canyon or uh, eight when this book takes place. I didn't really get it. Um, and I guess one of the reasons was we weren't like an ABC wide world of sports family when he really became famous for his stunts. Uh, on that show, um, but Kimmel uh, is a friend, and and he had all this evil Knievel stuff in his in the bar of his fishing lodge, and I was just what what is this like? What like I get it's the snake we're we're on the Snake River and he jumped, but like you really like him? He's like and he knew I, he knew my next book was going to be in the seventies, and he knew that I was kind of like trying to figure out what to write about. And he said, you really need to look into it. This guy was a great character. He was an amazing character. And he was right. He is an unbelievable American archetype. Uh, and Trumpy before Trump in many ways. Uh, and speaking of missing the charm, is Evil Knievel a precursor to Trump? Yeah. The I, way you describe him as a narcissist and showman who is tethered neither to decorum nor facts, who is tapping into people's fear and anger seems... Similar. Well, like I said, I mean, I write these books from the perspective of today, having fun with the past. Um, but yeah, he definitely was. I mean, there is a P.T. Barnum, and this isn't meant necessarily disparagingly, but there is an element of P.T. Barnum uh, braggadocio to a number of American archetypes, Donald Trump certainly, um, but also, you know, in professional wrestling you see it, like The, the Rock, or John Cena, you see it with Muhammad Ali, who actually you know, wasn't a glorious athlete. You see it with uh, Evil Knievel, you see it with P.T. Barnum, like I said, and it is a, an American archetype of these people who are just kind of these creatures of the media and say whatever they wanna say, and they're outrageous, and we in the public cannot get enough of them. Your book raises the question now burning about whether the two sides of America can ever understand each other. Probably not, um, but uh, I think there needs to be uh, a certain kind of, I don't want to say disarming, but there needs to be a certain uh, empathy and compassion that comes into how our increasingly divided society uh, relates to each other. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there, there were 350 million Americans and each one of us has our own way of looking at the world and the truth. And sometimes, I'm sure we all feel, I know I feel, I don't understand why other people don't see things the way I see them, especially when it comes to me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, why don't they see me the way I see myself? Which is, by the way, you know, not heroic, but just like, I didn't do that, I didn't do that, I didn't do that. I'm talking about reading right-wing media, maybe. And, um, and it's because we all have our different ways of looking at the world. And to say that everybody voting for one candidate is such and such, I think is a damaging way to look at a huge swath of people each one of them has their own reason for voting a certain way. And 
maybe some of those reasons are bad, but maybe some of the other, maybe some of them are completely understandable. And especially if you look at the context of everybody tries to have their own support network, and that support network, increasingly in this day and age, comes with its own set of facts and reality. Um, all of which is to say, I just think we need to be kinder to each other um, and certainly fight for what we believe in uh, and certainly stand up for democracy and the notion of free and fair elections uh, and truth and facts regarding those free and fair elections. But that said, uh, I'm not a big fan of dismissing swaths of the country. The book alternates chapters narrated by a brother and sister, and the brother is a Marine veteran. Did you pick that because you had extensive experience covering the military? You wrote an award-winning book about Afghanistan that got turned into a movie, and at one point you talk about the nation's tragic misuse of its loyal sons. Yeah, so both Charlie, um, who's the main character in the first and second book, and Ike, who's uh, the main character, or, or one of the two in the third book, are veterans, Charlie in World War II and Ike in a fictitious battle in Lebanon. I do write about veterans a lot. I do um, care about veterans a lot. I'm very active with a group called Homes for Our Troops that builds specially designed homes for severely wounded veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan, which to me is an organization that shouldn't have to exist because the US government, after sending these people to do these things, should pay for them to have specially designed homes uh, for their, their <laughs> wounds. Um, but that's not the world we live in, and this is the one we're in, so we, we, I work for Homes for Our Troops. It is important for me to write about um, veterans and to give some understanding. You'll appreciate this. So I wrote, um, I was trying to figure out, as there's a scene where they're, they're in Lebanon, um, you don't really understand why, why Ike is all messed up and has post-traumatic stress and has gone AWOL or whatever until a few chapters into the book and I wanted to write convincingly about it and I, I wanted to know what Marines would say when they were running and I reached out to Seth Moulton, uh, who's a congressman from Massachusetts um, and because, for some, because of the movie Stripes, I thought they would be saying like boom shakalaka laka, boom shakalaka laka. <laughs> They're not even Marines in stripes, but whatever. And I was like, but I had to, I reached out to Seth and I'm like, would, what would they be saying? And anyway, he tried to help me out. Um, I, he's, he's footnoted in the, in the book. But yeah, no, it's important for me to write about uh, veterans because we as a society are responsible for electing the leaders that send these people off to do impossible things in countries that don't want them to be there. And then they come back um, often irreparably damaged and... Um, even in fiction, I want to acknowledge that and write about it because it, it's important to me. A as someone who did not serve and as somebody who for decades was blissfully unaware of these struggles uh, kind of to compensate for what these people do for me. Uh, the newspaper that Lucy, our heroine, goes to after the star is a racy tabloid owned by a wealthy, shady, ruthless British family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So shades of Murdoch, and do you think the Murdochs created the atmosphere tapping into fear and anger and fabul fabulist narratives that allowed Trump to rise? Yeah, so Max Lyon is the Rupert Murdoch-esque uh, character who runs, who's the, who starts this um, DC tabloid in the book. Um, this is during the era that Rupert Murdoch there is no such person as Max Lyon, I made him up, but he is very, not even alluded, it's very directly based on Rupert Murdoch, without question. Um, some of the lines that Max has in the book are things that Murdoch has actually said, uh, especially in terms of his philosophy of journalism, which is that uh, news consumer behavior is driven by either fear or rage. And once you understand that, you can see, you can understand everything having to do with the New York Post or Fox. Fear or rage, that's what they want you to do because it, it's, a, it's a consumer decision, not a journalis journalistic decision, a consumer decision. They want to give you people to be mad at or people to be afraid of. And once you understand that, it's very simple what they're doing every single time. They're attacking migrants or me or Maureen or whomever. Uh, they don't want people to fear us, they want people to hate us, but they want people to fear the migrants or whomever. Anyway. 
Yeah, very directly based on it. And absolutely, um, Murdoch is a cancer on American journalism, 100%. Like Sam Donaldson before you, you're known for skewering politicians. Uh, was there ever a question you were afraid to ask? Uh, I had to take a Xanax before I asked Donald Trump if he ever paid for the abortion of a woman he was dating and if he kept Hitler by his bed, so. By the way, so this is really important and telling. Um, he, I think Maureen is still the only person that's asked him, asked him that. Uh, this was 2016, I think, and his response was, such an interesting question. What, a, what an interesting question. After ne next a que long pause. Next question. Yeah. No, he said, you're so funny, Maureen. <laughs> I'm like, that's a funny question. <laughs> yeah. um, Abortion often the topic of laugh riot comedy. But was there ever, did you ever want to ask someone something and... It is true that I have to steel myself to ask tough questions. I mean, especially of people for whom this isn't going to be the last time they're, it's much easier to ask um, tough questions of somebody who's a, who you think is about to disappear from the public stage. Like I, I asked very tough questions of the, the Sheriff Scott Israel after the horrible Parkland shooting where the Parkland police were completely uh, inept, and I asked him tough questions, and knowing that like I didn't care if I ever interviewed him again, uh, and that I felt like I was asking questions on behalf of the Parkland community, it's different when it's a politician who is not going away, not going anywhere. Um, uh, I can't think of any questions that I wish I had asked. I certainly can look back at interviews all the time that I wish I had been tougher in. Um, but there's no specific question. I, I do remember, especially one question, I do remember asking President Obama after the Sandy Hook shooting, um, having covered the issue a great deal and known that, and having known that um, for the four years, remember the this, this Sandy Hook shooting took place in December 2012, and uh, I think it was, it was definitely 2012, and um, for four years, he had not done anything when it comes to gun safety or gun regulation, nothing. And in fact, when Attorney General Holder started trying to do stuff, uh, Chief of Staff Rahm Emanuel told him to stop. He didn't put it that nicely. And um, so my, my question was when he came down and was very upset about what, he, what had happened at Sandy Hook, and I don't doubt that he was upset, but the question was, where have you been? Because there's, you know, there were other horrible school shootings, other horrible shootings during his presidency up until that point, including Aurora, for example. And I got a lot of heat from Obama folks and MSNBC and, and the like for asking that question. But I, I don't think I would, I, 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 it was a tough question to ask. Maybe the moment was wrong, but I didn't know when I was going to have another chance. And as somebody who cares very much about our schools being safe for kids and this Venn diagram that it seems not easy, but like obviously we have a mental health issue in this country and obviously we have a lot of guns in this country. And it seems like in that Venn diagram, there's action that can be taken uh, to keep guns out of the hands of people who are a danger <laughs> to themselves and others without infringing on the rights of people who want to have guns as is, you know, as the Supreme Court has found is their right. There is something that can be done there and he, and he didn't do anything. I, I still to this day uh, a squirm when I think about my, me asking that question, but at the same time I feel like you're the President of the United States and you haven't done a thing. Your first big four... See, it was a smattering. See, it was, <laughs> See my point? Okay. Yeah. Your first big foray into journalism at the Washington City paper after working in politics was about your platonic date with Monica Lewinsky. True. You skewered the Washington culture of scandal, and yes. now you have a show about scandals. And um, I'm just curious how that came about, and uh, what's the Jar Jar Binks theory? Okay. So um, the uh, the... United States of Scandal is a show that I conceived actually for CNN Plus, which is our short-lived streamer, but uh, it survived 
uh, that. And it is, I just thought it would be interesting and to go back and look at things that we thought were the biggest deal in the world from the perspective of the other side of, you know, a major constitutional crisis, a COVID pandemic, you know, the end of the Iraq war, the end of the Afghanistan war. We, like we have some perspective when it comes to these things. And also just to go back and like talk to the players. So we have done, the show airs Sundays at nine. We have done Rod Blagojevich and I got to talk to him, Mark Sanford and I talked to his chief of staff John Edwards, and I talked to his girlfriend, Riel Hunter. Um, Elliot Spitzer, and I talked to his chief of staff. And this Sunday, tomorrow night, it's uh, Jim McGreevy, and I talked to him. And then the one after that is about the leaking of Valerie Plame's name and WMD and all that. And I just thought it would be, we cover these things when they're happening. And we often don't get to talk to them, we often don't know what complications are going on. We're, you know, we're, we're reporting the news as it happens. We're writing the first draft. And by the time we, everything comes out, everybody's kind of over the scandal, right? Nobody, I don't know how many people, raise your hand if you read Andrew Young's book, Andrew Young, the, the aide, well, okay, Maureen. Uh, uh, the aide to John You should really Edwards. read it because it is the best book about sycophancy ever written. So Andrew Young was Edwards' campaign aide who, took, who said, oh no, that's actually my baby. Um, even though he was and then married. Took her, and then took her and the baby. Yeah, and then provided and a home. his yeah. wife on a crazy whirlwind tour of the it's, United States. I mean, it, when you think... And it's John like Edwards, a screwball comedy <laughs> crossed with a tragedy, a Greek tragedy. The John Edwards story still, of all of these stories, the John Edwards one is just, I, I still can't wrap my head around it. Well, that's it. what I was going to tell yeah. you. I watched it, and when, as Jake says, when you're in the middle of covering one of these big scandals... It, it always feels to me like I'm underwater or dreaming or something. You can't, you can't get a hold of it. You don't even know what to say about it. And I just sat there watching this John Edwards thing, and it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> it's so what, nuts. What was he thinking? Yeah, but, but I, I think that for all of them, right? But, like, this one is sociopathic. I mean, not only was he cheating on the mother of his children who was battling cancer, rest in peace, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Edwards. Um, and not only was he doing it with a woman who was his campaign videographer, not, not only was he doing it fairly flagrantly, <clears throat> not only did he get her pregnant, not only did he get an aide to claim it was his baby, all of this while he was running for president. <laughs> all of it while running for president. The other guys, it's like, they were just governors, right? I mean, they were just like sitting governors, doing their thing, whatever, horrible, un, you know, unrepentant, et cetera. But he was running for president, it's just so crazy. It's crazy. And I should be your leader. Okay. So you, you've moderated debates. Do you think Trump and Biden will debate or will neither of them show up? Um, I think Trump would love to debate him. Um, I, uh, I would imagine ultimately, I, I can't guess, because I do think the Biden people are clearly setting the stage for, for avoiding it, and I don't really know in this day and age that there's going to be a clamor uh, for it. Um, I, I can't predict. I think Trump would like to do it, uh, and Biden would probably prefer not, just based on that first debate that uh, Chris Wallace um, did that was just wild um, and Trump did not adhere to any of the rules and I think they're setting the stage for him to avoid it. You know? Do you think the Republican Party, do you think as Doug Brinkley says that Trump is an aberration and the Republican Party will somehow revert to what it was or now that he's reformed it in the shape of MAGA is it never going to? I think we're in the middle of a, of a great realignment of the political parties and I don't think we're going back to Mitt Romney uh, or John McCain, I think we are in the era of Donald Trump and Sarah Palin. And I think that's where we are, and the parties are not going to go back, I don't think. Fun. <laughs> and finally, I have to ask you, how do you feel about, since you're a huge Philadelphia Eagles fan, yeah. Jason Kelsey retiring? It's, uh, it's hard. So I love uh, Jason Kelsey. <clears throat> I'd like to thank his brother for getting my daughter interested in football. Um, <laughs> And me. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And uh, Saquon, Barkley. Saquon Barkley, I love it. Yes, absolutely. And uh, Tiki Barber taking shots at him. I have my thoughts on that too. Um, I, you know, I'm a huge Eagles fan. Jason Kelsey, like, if you watch the Kelsey brothers documentary, which was amazing, and you see how much damage that guy's done to his body for our beloved, my beloved Philadelphia Eagles, uh, you know, I, I feel bad, but like, he's allowed to have a life. And by the way, I just love Kylie Kelsey, his wife, so much. <laughs> Kylie Kelsey who would go to the Super Bowl with her husband and refuse to wear a Chiefs jersey because she's more of an Eagles fan than her husband who played for the Eagles. I mean, that is a woman after my own heart. I love her so much. So uh, I, he has retirement coming to him. And, you know, somebody said on Twitter uh, after, uh, after Jason Kelsey, like, you know, tailgated with the Kansas City Chiefs in honor of his brother. And I have a brother, and I love that. I love seeing how much... He loves his brother because that's how I feel about mine. And um, when he did the tailgating and he was just like the most enthusiastic Chiefs fan in the stadium, even though he was actually a player on the Eagles, uh, somebody tweeted like, I would watch a show where Jason Kelsey goes to individual sports teams and becomes an expert in their tailgate activities. And I sent it to Amy Antillis, that tweet, who, who was the person who greenlights uh, all these shows, the United States of Scandals and of other. I'm like, I would watch this too. <laughs> And she said, you're not the first one to send me this tweet today. What I love about Philly fans is whether they win or lose, they still tear stuff down. <laughs> so, is there, uh, Are we some not supposed to be doing that? Is that a... <laughs> All the demons are here. I'm actually in Jake's Wikipedia calling this a fun read, and it <laughs> is a really fun read, so get it. Thank you, everyone, and thank you to Maureen Dowd. Amazing, as always, Maureen Dowd.